So Patrick, um, I guess I'd just jump in and, and maybe as a way of introducing yourself, I mean, you are, I think without a doubt, one of the coolest guys I know. And the question would be, of all the things you could have done with your life, why did you pick AI as the place to, to make your stand and to jump in deep? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. You make it sound like a conscious choice. Um, but uh, when, when I was a kid, uh, we had computers uh, before most people had them because my father was an econometrician and used computers to create uh, econometric models. And so I just learned to program at an early age. And in third grade, I read uh, Arthur C. Clarke's book, 2001, A Space Odyssey, you know, about the computer that goes haywire and uh, was just fascinated with this idea that you could make a computer intelligent and make it talk to you. And so I spent a lot of time as a kid kind of programming uh, what might now be called chatbots and that sort of thing, trying to get a machine to talk to you. Um, so it was always an interest of mine, but I went to, to college in 1987 and nothing was happening in AI at the time. I took like the one seminar you could take on it, but there weren't really any avenues, so I studied cognitive psychology instead. Um, but around the time that I was sort of, uh, you know, working on my dissertation and finishing up graduate school, some interesting things were starting to take off with speech recognition, natural language understanding, computational linguistics. Um, and so I had the opportunity to, to go in that route um, and then to get a postdoc at CSLI, which um, uh, Alicia was talking about. Um, yeah, and it just sort of led to a, a life in AI. So, so what, um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. So what's your, what's your kind of current focus and you know, what's, what's your company trying to achieve here? Yeah, so our, our company, um, uh, we, we lease to large organizations what we call a cognitive computing appliance, you know, which is just a smart computer that has all of our algorithms on it and companies can lease it and use it to analyze all their data. Um, we, we call it uh, human capacity cognitive computing, and um, I, I, I borrowed that term uh, from Noam Chomsky, um, and uh, actually a paper from Hauser, Fitch, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch in about 2005 or six, uh, where they pointed out that uh, human language is distinguishable from the communication modes of other species by three particular things. Uh, one of them is that humans have this capacity for recursion, so we can take ideas and embed them into other ideas and then take that package and embed it in something else. And this gives us this rich sort of syntactic and semantic capacity um, that, I mean, we don't know what's in bird songs, but it doesn't seem like other creatures have that same recursive capacity that humans have. Um, and the second one is uh, what we call multimodality, and that's just that humans, we have a you know, auditory symbol system that we use to communicate, but we can easily substitute other types of uh, symbol systems. So I can say, hand me the glass, or I could say, could you hand me that, and point to it, and your brain is able to fuse one modality with another modality, put them together, uh, and we're so good at doing this that even people who have completely lost their ability to communicate in the auditory channel can use a separate symbol system and have a language that's just as rich as you know, what we consider to be the primary communication. Um, so, and then the third, the third capacity is um, sort of stems from the recursion, and that's this idea of um, sort of the infinite use of finite means because we're able to, to do these recursive uh, sort of embeddings with language and with communication symbols. Um, we can create an infinite number of messages with just the finite number of letters and words that we have at our, at our disposal. Um, so as I say, that wasn't me, it was Noam Chomsky, so if it's wrong, you can take it up with him. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think it's a very compelling message about uh, the kinds of things we should be paying attention to uh, when we're trying to develop a communication system that um, uh, that humans will respond to and that will respond to us in, in a very human way. You know, we can focus on the things that all animals can do, you know, communicating and sort of simple messages and stuff, but if we really want something that's going to work well with humans, uh, it clearly needs to have these sort of capacities. So. 
that theory sort of drove the research that went into designing the architecture of our AI system. So, so being, being kind of a, a, a deep AI insider, but being you're relatively new to the world of immersive technology, what, what, what has it been that you've been walking around at the, at the, at the event so far and seeing and, and having kind of sparks of ideas about where there could be interesting overlaps between these two families of technologies? Yeah, yeah. Um, all kinds of really cool stuff. I mean, the, the, the more, every new thing I try, I think about, you know, ways that you could work AI into, um, you know, whatever sort of demo or, or thing that we're looking at. Um, I, uh, particularly the one that, uh, Innoactive, I thought, you know, just this idea of being able to sort of create a room that you can collaborate in and, uh, you know, just sort of draw things in the air and bring in objects, make them disappear, teleport to wherever you want to go. I could just imagine that being immensely useful in all kinds of different uh, areas. Um, and then, you know, also things like having a, an augmented, I mean, Augmented reality is clearly a place where AI is going to play a huge role. Um, you know, I think of AI as being an expansion of sort of human consciousness, and we can talk more about that, but I also see virtual reality as sort of a, a sensory flip side of that expansion of consciousness where um, you know, we're able to vastly increase the number of sort of sensory signals that we're taking in and have AI maybe help us process those. Can, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, what, what, what would that mean to you know, the average user if you were developing something that would, that would dive into that particular kind of use case? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I come at this problem thinking, like, what, what is the brain for? Why do we have a brain? Anybody want to take a guess? Like, that's a stupid question. I have a brain, so when I wake up in the morning, I know where the coffee machine is, and I can get rolling, and I, I know how to talk to people at work and, and all that stuff. But, but really, like, why, why do we have a brain? Why is it there? What do we need it for? Um, so I have what I think is something of a radical idea that the real purpose of the brain is to act as a compression device. Okay, we have lots of information coming in. Uh, we talk about the fact that we have five senses. Uh, really, we have more like 11 senses because your, your sensations of touch, you've got uh, sensory nerves for hot and cold and pain and different types of things. Um, but there are billions of you know, nerves coming into your brain and your brain is dealing with these nerves firing every 10 to 40 milliseconds. Uh, so there's just an incredible amount of information that your brain has to deal with. So, you know, does it take all of this information and sort of analyze it in, you know, its raw form? No, there's no way it can do that. So what it does instead is it acts as a compression device, taking information from in different formats. You know, you have sound, you have vision, you have touch, uh, and it tries to fuse these things into meaningful chunks. Um, and it does this by compressing information, and by compressing, you also discover structure. Um, now I've forgotten why I was talking about that. What was the question? Yeah. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're asking about that, you know, the, this, the, you're, you're taking this dive into, you said, what, what you think the, uh, the purpose of the brain is. Right. You know, and I was just going to just jump on that question, because yeah, yeah. you talked about the brain is actually, you know, you say, you, you make this argument, the brain is acting essentially as a compression device. Right. And I think you were just about to jump into, well, what's the purpose of all that compression? What's the purpose of doing all of that work? Right. Right. So, you know, there, there is a lot of information in the world. Um, and to kind of understand, you know, why would the brain need to compress information or how does that lead to the brain doing the things that it does, there's this kind of, um, you know, hand-in-hand -hand, um, interplay that goes between compression and discovering structure. In fact, you might argue that there are two sides of the same coin. Um, so that when you're taking in events that are happening in your world and they're happening auditorily and vi visually, uh, these events over time and in space in these four different dimensions, uh, as they get compressed together, if they're compressed together in an optimized way, they'll be compressed in such a way that you discover structure both in space and in time. 
Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, you know, when I talk about sort of VR as being an expansion of consciousness like AI, with VR we now have the ability to add even more sensors to, you know, the 11 senses, sen sensory nerve capacities that we already have. Um, so, you know, you can, in a VR device, uh, you know, put all kinds of signals in there. Stuff about business intelligence or, you know, things about your, the status of your home and your family and, and stuff like that. You know, everyone knows when, when you're a parent, you kind of develop this other sense where there's the ch children are always in the back of your mind. You kind of know where they are, who's going to take care of them next, that kind of thing. It becomes this other sense. I used to live in New York City, and I would joke that having a car in New York City was a lot like having a child because you had to constantly be aware where it was parked, when the parking was going to expire, you know, what you, how you're going to have to arrange your life to go get the car. So there's this thing that, you know, you develop this sense of where's my child or where's my car. With VR, you can kind of offload all of that, you know, create sort of a, an, an AI, you know, expanded sensory store uh, and, you know, have VR kind of represent these things externally in some way. So talk, we talked a little bit about, you know, before, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, how virtual and, and augmented reality can, can somehow, you know, when we bring it together with AI, be acting as this type of very intelligent assistant, you know? Right. So we don't have to be using some of our, our cognitive load to be keeping track of things and things that, you know, we had this conversation, I think, on the train, things that, um, if you were very, very wealthy, you would not be doing a lot of tasks that, right. that, that we might normally be doing now. Yeah. You would have kind of a network of experts who are doing a lot of the feeding of information to you mm -hmm. then sort of, you know, uh, priming you to act in a higher capacity. Right. So, so when you think of, of, of AI and AR in that way, um, what, what's really required to bring those two worlds together? What's really required from, from the AI side to make that happen? Yeah, so... So just in terms of platform, I mean, um, I see, you know, VR as something, or, or AR, where, you know, we can take all these different sensors. Um, you would need some kind of platform where the sensors can be input into the AI, into um, what I call a common representational space. And that just means that, um, you know, in the same way that our brain takes sight and hearing and sort of fuses them together in one part of the brain, the frontal lobe, uh, we could also have an AI that takes all these various, you know, inputs from things, puts them into a common representational space, uh, and can serve as, you know, an expanded memory for you, an expanded uh, sort of pattern recognizer, you know. Our brains are pretty good, but we have limited capacity, and you know we forget about things all the time, which is why it's great to have phones and you know the AI that's in Siri and stuff to sort of remind you about things. Um, but uh, you know when you when it comes to um, to sort of the you know bringing all those things together in a way that you could create a very compelling virtual reality world that you know. Um, really helps you feel like you have an expanded awareness. Um, that, I think, is where, you know, the, the major sort of um, uh, benefits are going to be. Because mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the, this idea of, you know, the, the inputs being one, one thing that's going to make, you know, the, the combination of AI and VR and AR together really interesting in that we're going to gain lots of new insights, potentially, from the new data that these types of systems can capture. Yep. Um, we also talked about outputs, you know, what these things can give us in terms of, of new types of understanding, new mm -hmm. types of representation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it'd be good to jump in on that, on that, on that input side. So when we, when we think about, um, you know, virtual, virtual reality systems, either, you know, the head-mounted displays and all the information we're capturing or the body capture that's happening to, to show a lot of the things that we were seeing yesterday, um, or with augmented reality, with these cameras that are constantly scanning the environment, doing depth sensing, what are, the, what are the things that you as an AI scientist see, oh, if I had this data, we could do this type of learning? Yeah, yeah. so one of, the, one of the things that I think is really going to be sort of the, the killer app, if you will, of AI and virtual reality and augmented reality in the future is just what I call salience tracking. Um, so, you know, we move about in the world and we pay attention to things that seem to be important. 
Um, you know, when we look at paintings, we mostly look at the faces. Um, there are, in, in AI uh, algorithms right now, called attention mechanisms. And an attention mechanism basically tells an AI algorithm, you know, if you're looking at a photo, what should you be paying attention to? Uh, and it might highlight faces in a photo or, you know, types of food and stuff. Um, in a, as well, in a sentence, you know, it might highlight the sort of the subject and the object, and it does this using neural networks in just a statistical way. Uh, but people, when they started introducing these attention mechanisms to machine learning, found that it greatly improved, you know, the kind of results you were able to get. So we can expand that attention mechanism to just sort of events happening in everyday life and say, you know, what is it that's worth paying attention to? If I'm walking around with AR glasses on, you know, I've only got sort of a limited range of view, whereas we could potentially put sensors all around your body or your car or whatever. And so those areas where you have blind spots, you can get information from them. Um, but it's not enough just to get the information because then your brain would just be overwhelmed with all this stuff. So you need something that knows, you know, what is salient in the environment and what do you want to pay attention to. Um, so that's an area that I think, you know, would be, you know, if it's like, there's a guy with a knife behind you, <laughs> you know, you better run, uh, something like that. If, uh, you know, if we're able to, to uh, work that into augmented reality, or maybe, you know, you're at a, a party or something, and you're talking to someone, and you, your AI is like, hey, this person is interested in you. I don't know if you noticed, because you're kind of <laughs> just obsessed with talking about yourself right now. Um, but that's something I could see as being, you know, a useful sort of, uh, salience tracking feature. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, a, that's one area that's going to be really big. Well, and, and, and that was something you'd, you'd, you'd mentioned earlier, you know, there was this, there's this really exciting thing of, of, you know, we have this potential to capture all of this data that tells us uh, all these interesting things that are salient to us, right? Mm -hmm. But then if you think of the artificial intelligence being part of a system, it's also all of the other sensors that are out there in the world learning from each other. Right. You know, sort of the autonomous vehicle uh, model that if, if one car gets in an accident or sees something new, all of the cars in the system learn right. from it. You have the, the Borg, Star Trek Borg <laughs> uh, mechanism, yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that will be true of machines, I think, like cars, and it will also be true of humans. You know, we'll be able to, um, you know, if you are able to implement this salience tracking, you know, on a personal level, um, and then, you know, upload that to some kind of, you know, meta model of human experience uh, that you could then download into everybody else's, say, augmented reality glasses um, and, you know, people could then be walking around learning from the experience of others that like, hey, when you see this happen and then th this happens, like most of the time in the world, it means this, you know, it means this is going to happen next. And so you get a little sort of indication of, of that. So, yeah. Know, that indicates that. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. to think of this kind of meta level. We had a speaker last year, a cognitive science who was a scientist who was here. And you know, like you said, you, you were talking at the beginning, like we, or the brain is a compre compression device and it's there, you know, trying to discover structure, discover patterns. He was arguing that the fundamental purpose of the brain is, 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 a, is a prediction making device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think of the prediction making device of the brain being augmented now by this prediction making device of all the other potential sensors that are out there gathering data, exactly. feeding into the system. System. Exactly. I mean, your, your, your brain has evolved to, you know, deal with the limited number of senses and the limited sort of experience of time that, you know, worked for humans for, for millions of years. Um, as I said earlier, I, I don't think it's wrong that it's a prediction device. I think it's just sort of, that's the flip side of it being a compression device. And because you are compressing sort of the meaning of events happening in time, uh, that just automatically leads to prediction. Um, so that the brain, um, you know, the fact that it's a prediction is sort of epiphenomenal of, you know, the, the idea that we can take events in time and compress them into meaningful chunks. Um, so yeah.
So, so when we're, we, we had an interesting moment uh, last night when we went over to the hackathon. We had, there's one group in the hackathon that's, that, that has this interesting model of learning and they want to collect data and be able to learn from it. And you were you know, guiding some of, the, some of the younger hackers about, well, how would they start to learn about AI? For the people who are here who are really interested in these two fields and want to find a, find a way to combine them, what, what's your advice for getting started in, in really being able to learn about and apply AI? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I wouldn't recommend going back to college uh, in, in this day and age. You can easily um, get all the resources you need online. Um, I signed up recently. Uh, David Silver had this, uh, and Sebastian Thrun had this uh, Udacity self-driving car course. Um, and I signed up for that just to, you know, sort of find out what was going on in this self-driving car stuff since you know I do deep learning and AI, but the car thing is not really my area, so I want to know more about it. Um, but I was amazed at like, you know, all these young people who are just like, you know, so excited about this and could just jump right into, you know, working on real life problems. Um, so AI is this area where there are all these resources online that you can really, you know, sink your teeth into just immediately um, and start working, you know, your own approach to problems like, can I create a deep neural network that's going to recognize cats the same way that Google did in 2013? Mm -hmm. um, and you can, and that's it's fantastic. So if you're talking to a young person who was interested in AI, where, where do you think are the most kind of promising avenues of research for, for, for real impact in the future? If you look at AI as a field, where, where would you go if you were going to start again? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously there's a lot of uh, AI that focuses on sort of uh, recognizing things in pictures and video and stuff like that. Um, and I, you know, if you're interested in that, that's definitely a, a great area to pursue. Um, but, and I'm biased, but human language is really that uncracked nut, you know, and I, I think we've, we, we've made some splits in the shell, but uh, it, it's something that is, you know, as I was saying before in reference to Chomsky, uh, it's something that is really unique to humans. Uh, we can't just sort of look out at the rest of nature and figure out how it works or why it works that way. Um, so we don't have a lot of insight into, you know, sort of the inner workings at the neural level of what is, you know, actually happening in the brain. Um, so, the, you know, the thing that everybody's doing now is just playing around with different neural network architectures and, you know, seeing how well they do at uh, mimicking or, um, you know, getting close to what we see when we actually communicate with each other. Um, and I, 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 it's not an easy problem and it's something that's going to be, uh, I think, ongoing research for at least the next 10, 20 years. It seems like an exciting area, too, because we were talking, I mean, I think we had a, a conversation with, uh, with Dominic Escofier of NVIDIA, mm -hmm. and he was talking about, you know, one of his favorite VR cases right now is that Star Trek bridge crew, and, right. you know, using your voice to start to control things, and using your voice to send commands to someone who's responding to you in some way. Yeah. yeah it seems like a really promising area for this technology to somehow be more more useful more interesting absolutely and and you know these things like the you know the other interactive de demo where they had um, you know the thing that would take you through um, is it what's the name of the store uh, media oh, media, media mark yeah uh -huh. and uh, take you through the store and like help you find a TV and stuff like that um, you know great to have a little um, you know guy who will do that for you uh, but if it was really intelligent, you could ask it all kinds of questions, you know, it would be able to answer things like, um, you know, does this have a phono input, and which the people at Best Buy can't answer, um, <laughs> I, I found. Um, but, you know, things like that, or you, you could, you know, sort of ask it, like, I'd really like to see how this is going to look in my living room, and then have it, you know, tap in some key that brings in the virtual reality of your living room with the stereo in it, and you can check it out. And if you had sort of AI and virtual reality and augmented reality working hand in hand like that, uh, you know, I think it would be a powerful experience, and it's probably the experience of the not too distant future. Yeah, this is one of the use cases I, I you know, we'd, I think we'd mentioned at some point that was, you know, you were talking about this ability to sort of track a room and learn from it, and it's an AI case that that I'm I'm both excited about and scared about. Once once we start collecting all this data, like we have conversations all the time at home where you know I'll be I'll make some claim, 
that claim is said, no, you didn't ever say that, or you said something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> and personally, I think, I, I don't know if I would love or if I would hate the, the AI assistant who said, y you did actually say that. Right. You know, right. here's what really happened. Right, the, the accountability <laughs> AI. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, that could be very useful in, you know, just sort of the conflicts of the real world, too, where, you know, obviously we're all fighting about what the truth is these days and what, you know, what, if, what do facts mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, how are we representing what's, what's going on in the world, um, you know, and not so much AI, but just sort of the expansion of, of uh, you know, human memory, just things like putting dash cams on dashboards uh, to sort of have evidence of what happened in an accident, um, you know, in my opinion has improved humanity, I mean, not specifically the dash cams, but, you know, just sort of this expansion of technology and of our ability to um, get at what is the truth, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's obviously happening in my country right now where, like, people who grew up where you could just make up the truth continue to do that, and then the media's like, but wait a minute, we have evidence here of you saying the exact opposite thing, um, and we'll see whether that has any impact on results in the next election. <laughs> yeah, when, when, when we hear Donald Trump saying the AI is fake news, then we know we're, we getting, we're getting somewhere, yes, right? <laughs> right, fake AI. <laughs> I wanted to kind of make this as a bridge to, to something that I know is, you know is a conversation I've had a lot in Germany, which is, um, is there anything in this field, is there any avenues of research that, um, that scare you, that, that, you're, that you're afraid of the, the future for AI, or of AI? Sure, I mean, you know, Obviously, there's all kinds of nefarious things that you can do when you have an autonomous AI that, um, you know, you might... With most AI, you have to give it some kind of objective. Um, and we were talking about this last night, and the example came up of, you know, what if you told an AI, we want to figure out the best way to, um, you know, reduce energy usage, and the AI then comes to the conclusion, just kill all the humans, and then they won't use any energy. Um, so I guess that's something to worry about. But, but hopefully in that system where you ask it you know, to figure out the best thing, um, you would not also have tell the AI, oh, we've got all these autonomous killer drones that you, know, you could use if they're, if they're going to be useful in this regard. Um, so really, it's, you know, there's, the, I guess my point is there's, there's going to be a, a nefarious person with nefarious intention behind any kind of nefarious AI. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I think we do need to continue to discuss, discuss the ethics of AI, you know, discuss what are the guidelines, you know, are we going to try to um, implement a kind of, uh, you know, Isaac Asimov uh, rules for the robots type of thing or um, probably something much more extensive, um, uh, which is already happening right now. So. Well, and, and, and that's, that's the, you know, the, the, the next point that I, was, that I wanted to think about when, when we're talking about the power of AI. You know, this discussion is always happening within the context of power in society. Mm -hmm. right? So having these more powerful systems, having these more powerful networks isn't totally neutral. You know, in some way, it, it democratizes power and it also concentrates power. Right. You know, and I think that's a question that's really, that's really salient in, in Germany, is what happens when we have these systems that are able to see most of reality most of the time? How is that, is that potentially going to be used against us? Is that going to free us or is that going to put us in a, you know, in a, in a prison? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm, a pes I'm a optimistic Pessimist or pessimistic optimist, one of those. Um, but I do think that, you know, overall, technology has improved our lives and uh, gone more to the side of democratizing than, uh, than the opposite, you know. So knowledge is now available in a way that it was never available before. And, you know, countries that are totalitarian and are worried about that do everything they can to keep that access to knowledge out of the hands of people. But we all know that it's just a matter of time before their ability to do that collapses. Um, and we're going to have you know, a much better educated world population. Um, so I think the same is, is true with AI, that it's going to bring 
everybody, you know, capabilities that right now are concentrated in the hands of, you know, only, only the rich people who can afford to have assistants around them, you know, telling them things and helping them to do things. Um, and if you can have your own, you know, AI that tells you, hey, now's the time to buy XYZ stock, um, or, you know, maybe you should look into buying a new home right now, um, you know, this gives you the advantage that previously only people within a limited sphere of knowledge uh, would have had. Um, and so, so I think it is going to move us towards a better society. At the same time, there's going to be a massive um, transition uh, akin to what we saw at the turn of the 20th century when we migrated from a primarily agricultural economy to, you know, sort of the industrialized economy that we have now. Um, it was just uh, about a hundred years ago that uh, John Deere bought a diesel engine company, uh, you know, and started to create tractors that could just drive by themselves. Uh, well, not drive by themselves, obviously, but you could have one person, you know, mowing a field instead of 30 people, and lots of people were put out of work, and, you know, we saw there was a, a huge economic depression that happened in the, in the 1930s. Largely, I would argue, because of failed government policies uh, that didn't create a safety net um, for re-educating a population that was now in rapid and drastic transition. Um, and Franklin Roosevelt in the U.S. came in and, you know, tried to implement those types of policies. Um, so, I, so I do think um, uh, the future of AI depends a lot on how humans get together and decide on the policies that we're going to implement to try to help people transition into this new new world. Um, but it, 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 it will be difficult, as, as all these things are. Maybe this will, this will touch on your, your optimistic pessimism or your pessimistic optimism. Uh -huh. um, your, your daughter is, is, is eight? Is yep. She do you think that she's going to have a, a more experience of freedom in her life or less than you have? Uh, well, I think she already has more freedom in many ways. Um, she's certainly not as bored as I was as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, boredom brings creativity, I guess. But, uh, but also just providing people with you know, rich educational environments, um, you know, I think helps the, the developing brain. And, um, you know, we, we have sort of an understanding about education now that goes way back, you know, way beyond what we were doing 30 years ago, uh, 40 years ago. And um, so for, for children now, I mean, I think we, we don't really know what the future is going to be like even 10 years from now. Is, you know, is she actually going to be, need to go to a university or not? Maybe not. Um, and I'll just try to be one of those parents who doesn't get stuck into, you have to do things this way because that's the way I did it, um, because I think it's going to be a very different, different world. Uh, on, on, on that kind of note, and this is something I wanted to, uh, to now open up, I mean, you and I both come from academic backgrounds. Mm. I think we have a lot of passion for interaction, for teaching. Um, I definitely wanted to, to give some time to open this up to the audience, because I know there have to be people here who have a lot of ideas about AI or a lot of questions about them. So um, I'd like to open it up to, to, to some time for discussion or just yeah. time to, for questions. So, and I know most people are hesitant to start it off. So we will stand here quietly. <laughs> Anyone have questions or thoughts about what you've heard or things you wish you had heard more about? And we, we have a microphone. We'll, we'll run a microphone around, but you can, you can for you, say your question and I'll repeat it. Right. So, for the rest of you, the, the, the question, if I don't, if I have it right, is um, you know, AI is going to create some kind of vast transition in the work workforce, and so how is that going to change our professional lives? Um, so, so my take on that is, uh, you know, there may be a rough 
transition period. Um, and probably, if things are going in the way I see them going, um, the, difficult, the, the most difficult thing is that um, we're going to see a contraction of the economy in a way that we're just not used to at this point. Um, you know, we're used to seeing things growing, things get more expensive, we make more money, we try to do more, more, more. And with AI taking up a lot of the slack of things that we do, um, first of all, you're going to see the marginal cost of products go down. So, you know, when you've got an AI that can make your food, do the farming, and they could actually build a house for you and that sort of thing, or, or you know, you get in a car and it's just a, you know, computer that's driving you around, the, the amount of money you need to produce these products and therefore to consume them becomes much less. Um, so while you might initially be nervous that like, uh, oh gee, I don't have to work five days a week anymore uh, to make the money that I need, at the same time, you may have less disposable income, but you won't need as much income because a lot of the slack is being taken up by, by machines. Um, you know, that said, you, you might then wonder, well, what am I going to do with all of that extra time? And what am I actually going to do for a job? Um, I, I do think that AI has promise, but it's not going to replace all of what we consider to be the really meaningful human work. Um, and so my hope is that uh, AI can kind of offload most of what we think of as just the soul-sucking aspects of our daily lives and, you know, get a machine that doesn't have a soul to do that uh, so we can do the things that make us feel like our, our souls are being expanded, you know, wh whether they are creative. Well, I think, you know, even if you're doing something technical, the work that is not soul-sucking is usually creative in some way. Um, and so uh, I would hope that you know, these things that we, that we really value, that really make us human, become the things that we can value and focus on a lot more than, than what we do right now. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> Kathleen. Right. Yeah, so uh, the question is, um, what do I think about Androids? Uh, do we need them? We, we have Siri and Alexa that are just little boxes, and we can talk to them just fine. Do we need things that actually walk around and, you know, try to act like humans? Um, and then Kathleen brought up uh, what's called the Uncanny Valley, which if you haven't heard of it, I'm sure most of you have, uh, is just this this weird place where you can make something look like, you know, a cute robot cartoon thing and people are fine with it, but when you try to make it look too much like a human, but it's not quite like a human, it really bothers us. Um, and we used to have at AT&T, we were doing a project with um, this talking head that's lips would move with the um, speech synthesizer, and, um, but when she stopped talking, she would just sort of stare at you like this, and you're like, ah, cover up the screen. I, I don't like her staring at me like that. Um, so that, that is the, the uncanny valley experience. Um, but, so yeah, I, I don't think we necessarily, um, I, I think it's very difficult, you know, as you were sort of pointing out with the fingers and the feet thing just in, in avatars uh, or in animations, it's very difficult to get it right with, you know, not only, I mean, there's just sort of the visual aspects, but then there's just the subtleties of human interaction, you know, and there are even, you know, a good number of humans who can't get that quite right, you know, and then you're talking to somebody, you're like, you're, you're a little weird, you know, I like you, but yeah, you've got, you're, you do some weird things sometimes. Um, and so, you know, if it's something that even we can't really codify very well, we, we don't know how to operationalize it, I don't see how we're ever going to get uh, machines to do it. I mean, you can argue, well, you're an AI, AI guy, we'll just have AI learn it. Um, but, you know, when humans spend 
10, 20, 30, 40 years like trying to learn these things and we still have a difficult time with it, uh, I'm skeptical that we would really get you know, an Android to sort of behave the way that Commander Data behaves, um, even though he's a little weird, but yeah. <laughs> but, Go ahead. <laughs> I think on that note, I, 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 my, my only guilt about putting together a talk like this is knowing that we're only going to just barely scratch the surface yeah. on the million and one fascinating things that, that this, this topic brings up. Um, we have a lunch break. Uh, I'm going to let everyone you know, get to the lunch break, but I also want to invite anybody who'd like to continue the conversation um, with Patrick uh, to join him on the side of the stage or join him for lunch. Um, it's a wellspring of knowledge, and uh, love to have him be able to share more with you. Yeah, that'd be great. Know. Don't be shy. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good job. Yeah, nice work. Thanks. <laughs>